Hi, thank you for joining me again. Um, I'm excited to show you some of my 50s pieces. I'm going to show a few here and then I'll show some of the ones I've got at home. Uh, one disclaimer limitation I want to tell you is that I did not have any petticoats on hand in my collection because they're all at home, I use them. So all of these skirts are going to look a little flat. Keep in mind, from looking at from your work looking at period images and that kind of thing these skirts have some poof and they need some support structures underneath to look like they're supposed to so just bear that in mind as we look at them i wanted to start talking to you a little bit about undergarments the 1950s introduced a lot more structure in underwear and that's something that um, is very, very different from what we saw in the 40s when things were a little more relaxed. People still wore girdles in the 40s, but in the 50s, it started to get a little more extreme. Now, a little background on the 50s. The 50s started in 1947 when Christian Dior introduced the new look. There is some question over whether Dior was the first person to come up with the new look, but he was certainly the one to popularize it. After fashion had basically been largely frozen throughout World War II due to fabric shortages, people reacted. The pendulum went the other way, and we went from using basically as little fabric as possible in 1940s dresses to using as much fabric as possible in the 1950s. So we started to see a lot of really full skirts. Also, there was a big push for more um, femininity and designs. So we see a lot of waist emphasis, full busts, full hips, very, very feminine styles. In the 1950s, we're looking at women who were in the workforce in World War II, coming back, getting married at the end of the war, having babies, becoming housewives. And the fashions sort of reflected that push to push women back into the home so that men could have their jobs back. Now, I want to show you this um, shaper here. I believe this one to be from the 50s. You'll notice it's got a very pointy bust. The pointy bust is very, very typical of the 1950s. And because we're looking at this very slim um, fitted waist, we are looking at a lot of shapewear. There was even some corsetry reintroduced in the 50s. The 50s had two different silhouettes, one of which you'll see here, um, another one we'll see a little bit later. The first silhouette is the one that most people think of when they think of the 50s, and that's very, very fitted to the waist, big full skirt. So that's what you're gonna see behind me. The other silhouette was called, what we call now a wiggle dress. And this was still very fitted in the waist. We still had a lot of bust emphasis, but it was a slim fitted skirt. And so that's something that we see in the 1950s as well. We have two very different looking silhouettes for women going on at the same time. This shaper would be ideal for one of those more fitted wiggle dresses. We had other types of shapewear that ended right at the waist, allowing the hips to do their thing. So we see that with some of the dresses with full skirts. So this, this is a dress by RK Originals. It's a very, very sheer cotton. Um, it's got a little bit of a slub to it, giving it some visual texture. Um, very, similar to a very lightweight chambray, but you can see through it. Um, we've got two rows of buttons. There are belt carriers. This dress originally had a belt, no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, but you'll notice we've got these two rows of buttons kind of leading to an emphasis on the waist. You'll also see wider, sloped, more relaxed shoulders in the 1950s, and that's really evident with this dress. This has a sort of a built-in cap sleeve. It's got a little bit of a released tuck right here for the bust and for sleeve movement. We still maintain the side zipper. 1950s, we'll see a lot of collars on dresses. Um, so more casual dresses like this one. This one's pleated. You can see it's got quite a good little bit of skirt to it here. Would have been lovely with a petticoat. Pleats continue to the back. We've got the side zipper, no back closure. You really don't see any center back closures until the late 1950s, except for the little short neckline zippers that we saw in some of those 40s dresses. But 1950s, you're still gonna be seeing side zipper until you get to the late 50s, which is a convenient way to date things. Still, of course, all metal zippers, no nylon zippers. Next, I want to show you a little bit dressier dress. This is one of my favorites, and it's got some really solid uh, characteristics of 1950s fashion. It's got this little bolera, which fastens with hooks and eyes, just like this. 
Uh, bolero jackets were very, very popular. Most sleeveless dresses in the 50s had them. Um, often they're missing now. We're lucky enough to have this one with its dress. It's got a collar, low neckline, with a bit of a collar. This is about two inches wide. And this one's really fun because it's got two different coordinating fabrics. The top fabric, I don't know if you can see my fingers through this, this is a cotton voile and it's very, very sheer. So very lightweight, sheer fabric. And the dress underneath is made of a heavier cotton sateen. It's got quite a little bit of body to it. Um, and again, this would have been worn with a petticoat. So this is a strapless dress, a little bit of a dressier dress, really not formal, but definitely dressy. We've got rhinestone buttons down the front, which we see on a lot of dressier 1950s pieces. Again, we have our side zipper. Now, one thing you'll see in most 1950s dresses is you'll see there's a hook, a hook and eye right here at the waist. Because the waist of the dresses were so tight, putting a hook there was a way to take some of the pressure off of the zipper. Um, you'll see the same thing at the top of the dress. This, because it is strapless, it does have boning in it. So there's boning next to the back side of the zipper and in these two back seams, this princess seams, in the side seams, but nothing really in the bust. The bust is left a little unstructured. Um, we've got a pleated skirt. Again, this closure here is entirely decorative. It's formed by a sort of a pleat, it feels like, with these buttons, but you actually access the dress through the side zipper. You've all heard of the poodle skirt, but did you know that skirts in the 1950s took a lot of different forms? And this is one of them. Felt circle skirts were very, very popular, um, largely with younger women, um, teenage girls, college girls, in the 1950s. And they came in a huge variety of designs. Um, they were also worn by little girls. I've got a lot of patterns that are designed for young girls. And they can have anything. Poodles are most famous. This one uses ribbon, pieces of felt, and rhinestones that rivet these, felt, these pieces of felt on to spell out, I love you. I found this at a junk store in Houston and could not pass it up. These came in a huge variety of designs. This one is a Valentine's skirt. You could also have, I've seen them with horses or um, birds in bird cages. Um, there's a pat sewing pattern for that one. So this was kind of a blank canvas that you could use for whatever you wanted. Typically they were made of wool felt. Um, they've got a really good feel to them. They've got a lot of body. Put some petticoats under this and it's got some floof to it. Next, I'd like to show you a 50s suit. So um, we've got some excellent quality tailoring here. Same buttons that we saw in the 1940s. We've got kind of the outer circle and then an inner circle. We've got bound buttonholes here. Excellent dressmaking detail. And you'll notice this one still has shoulder pads. Um, almost all suit, suit jacket, wool suit jackets do. Um, this one is, I believe, 50s. We've got more of a nipped in waist a little bit more flare at the hips um, with this double row of buttons. It just kind of reads 50s to me. This is from Chester's um, 606 and 608 Church Street in Nashville. Now I want to shift your attention a little bit to a wedding dress and a formal dress that we have over here. This wedding dress came from middle Georgia. It is made of cotton organdy. You can see how crisp and how stiff this outer fabric is. This would have been worn with a hoop skirt, a crinoline, very similar to what you would see in the 1860s um, would have been worn with this dress. It has a huge skirt on it, as you can see. We've got a bit of a dropped waist here. Some 1950s designs did have a dropped waist. You still have that significant waist emphasis. You still have a very full skirt. It's a little different from the 80s dropped waist in that there is much more waistline emphasis in the 50s dresses. This dress has a signature embroidered in the lining, indicating that this wedding was June 27th, 1959, and it has the bride and groom's initials on it. Embroidered in blue, this would have been her something blue. We've got eyelet embroidery uh, on this uh, cotton organdy used on the neckline here and on the side. It buttons all the way down to just below the waist. We've got a little cap sleeve. 
Um, you do not see sleeveless wedding dresses in the 1950s. They either have short sleeves like this one or they've got long sleeves. Let's move on to this lovely little shot taffeta number. This is, I would, I'm guessing late 50s on this one as well. Uh, towards the late 50s, skirts started to get a little bit shorter and we start to sort of shift into some of those 60s looks. And we've got a little bit of that here. This one is a little bit of a bubble skirt. We've got some gathers forming some puffs here in this taffeta. We've got a lot of bodice detail interest. We've still got a very pointy bust on this garment. Um, very, very typical of the 50s. But you'll notice, aha, our side zipper has moved to the back. We've still got this waist reinforcement hook at the waist. Um, we've got a metal zipper um, in the center back here. Again, very indicative of the late 50s. Bit of rhinestone adding a little bling right here this fabric is just amazing though next we're going to go over to the table and take a look at a couple other pieces i wanted to show you um, a bodice and some accessories from the 50s um, this one was purchased in terrible condition it used to have a skirt the skirt is no longer with us but it was such a beautiful example that i wanted to show it um, again very very typical of the 50s we have this very very fitted waist this is a dressier dress. This one feels like silk organza. We've got a little bit of shattering going on here. This thing is sadly deteriorated. We've got non-functioning rhinestone buttons on the center front. And you'll notice that we emphasize the waist through a series of tucks taken through the bodice. This fabric was tucked first and then the darts were sewn in. We've got, again, this cut in one sleeve with a little bit of a cuff. It's just cut in the same with the bodice. And we've got a bit of a collar here. This one fastens with a side zipper. And then to make sure you can get your head through, we've got a snap on this very, very top button here. So hats in the 1950s came in basically two varieties, very large and very small. This one is on the very small end of the spectrum. It's one of my favorite hats. Um, you'll recall that hats often tend to follow hair, and this um, would have been worn with hair that was a little more close to the head. So the hat close to the head, hair close to the head. It is ornamented with flowers. It's a purple velvet ribbon. The inside, you can see the structure. It's got velvet covered millinery wire forming the structure and netting here that is used as a base to sew the flowers on. The next thing I wanted to show you is a Whiting and Davis purse. Um, I've had a couple of these. I actually carried this one until the handle gave out. Um, but this is entirely covered in a metal mesh, which was very, very typical for Whiting and Davis purses. It's got a metal zipper. I think it has one interior pocket. It's very flexible. It has a very, very cool feel, a little bit like chain mail. Thank you for joining me again, our continuation of the 1950s. Um, I wanted to show you some of the pieces that I keep in my closet for my own use. Uh, the, they're some of my best pieces. I wanted to show you this dress. Uh, this is by RK Originals. I picked it up at an estate sale in Athens, Georgia. This one is made of silk or a silk imitation, not really certain which. It's got some good, you know, slubs in it, some texture. Um, what you may have a hard time seeing because of the dark color of the dress, this buttons all the way down the front. It's got little plastic buttons, maybe half an inch with concentric circles in it. The dress is constructed um, with princess seams. So you've got a seam coming down here from the shoulder down to the waist and down into the full skirt. And this dress does have a pretty full skirt. This one is a particularly good example for the 50s because it incorporates a lot of these elements that were used to show waist emphasis. So first, um, we've got a bit of a collar here, just a small collar, not anything exaggerated like what we see in the 40s. In the 50s, we often see a smaller collar like this one reaching into a sloping shoulder. This sleeve is actually cut in one with the dress. It's not a separate sleeve piece. This kind of contributes to a soft sort of a sloped shoulder effect. And the, um, the dolman sleeve here with the curve, it kind of contributes to the illusion of a small waist. So we come down into a waist here 
and then into a full skirt that I have added petticoats to. Uh, petticoats were worn with full skirted dresses during this period. This dress has no back closure. Uh, what you'll see in a lot of dresses from the earlier part of the 50s is that they either fasten down the front with buttons or you've got the side zipper. Um, towards the second half of the 50s, end of the 50s, we'll start to see that center back zipper, but that hasn't really become a common thing yet. If we look at the interior of this dress, the dress has facings. You can see the facing right here. I'm holding the edge of it. Um, it is unlined, but the facing um, comes down from the collar um, about, I'd say a good four inches into the dress, tapering down a little more is to about three inches as we get towards the waist. Uh, very simple construction on this dress, but very effective. This is an unlabeled Claire McArdle. Um, it is from the 50s. You'll see a lot of similarities with the 40s Claire McArdles, um, but we've got a massively full skirt on this dress. Um, this one is made of rayon. Uh, the reason I know it's a Claire McArdle, these little brass hooks that are very, very specific to McArdle. This McArdle is a particularly flattering dress um, in keeping, again, with that 50s wider sloping shoulder narrow waist. Um, we've got, again, a sort of a cap sleeve that's cut in one with the bodice, very common treatment here. Uh, we've got some boning to help uh, where it hooks down the front. The dress is unlined, it's a little sheer. You need to wear a slip with it and petticoats. Also, because Claire McArdle was awesome, it has pockets. Now, this next one is a really, really good example of the dropped waist, 1950s. Um, kind of a variant on either silhouette that I wanted to make sure I showed you. This dress is cotton voile, a uh, very lightweight cotton, geometric print, and it's an Ellen K dress. We've got our typical side metal zipper right here um, going down below the waist we've got hooks that reinforce at the bottom of the zipper at the natural waistline right here and at the top this one's kind of interesting because unlike what we'll see later in the 80s although this 50s dress has a dropped waist it still has a lot of waistline emphasis right here it is very very fitted through the waist comes down and continues fitted through about the fullest part of the hip and then drops into a nicely gathered skirt. The details on this particular dress are really nice. Um, we've got piping right here along the seam, um, adding just a little bit of definition where the bodice meets the skirt. We've also got ruching throughout the bodice, um, giving it some good visual texture here. We've also got a wrinkle because I didn't put it on the form correctly. Um, we've got ruching right here at the bodice front, and this is kind of sewn where you've got, you've got princess seams here, and then you've got this seam coming down like this around the bust, giving you some really good bust emphasis with ruching in the middle, forming almost a sweetheart neckline, and then ruching also right here at the top of this little cap sleeve. This particular dress works really well as a, an almost off the shoulder. It's, it kind of hits at the very tip of the shoulder is what you'll see here. And we've got a little self fabric bow on each shoulder. Uh, my guess is this one was probably geared towards um, younger women, maybe late teens, early 20s. The back of the dress, um, because we have the side zipper, is uninterrupted by any closures. Um, the ruching is continued to the back and we've got this little cap sleeve that is also ruched onto the back. This dress has what we call a half high lining. This has been used in sheer dresses at least since the 1860s and this dress is no exception. The lining stops before you get up to the back. Um, this is a very dense cotton lining. Um, in hand it feels pretty similar to a bed sheet actually. Um, it's got a double turned edge right here where we've got our label and it doesn't come up over the shoulders which gives the shoulders a sheer effect it comes to just above the bust and you see the same thing here the seams of this dress are all to the inside um, this lining the seams are not hidden there is no seam finish on the darts right here and in a lot of ways this really looks like a homemade dress but it's not. You can see the gathers on the inside. The skirt is also lined. Um, this one was gathered by machine. A lot of the seams have been pinked. Now you may also notice the zipper tape is stitched down with a catch stitch. This was something that I added because the zipper was um, 
trying to bend outward. So I added that bit of a catch stitch there to keep it under control. This next dress I want to show you is a party dress, a semi-formal type of dress. It's not totally formal as it is T-length or a ballet length and not all the way to the floor. But this has some really good features I wanted to show you. If it looks a little long-waisted on the form, it's because this form is short-waisted like I am. This dress is also a little long-waisted on me. This is a lovely dress made of silk shantung. It, um, it's pretty lightweight, crisp fabric. You hear the good rustle it's got. We've got some little gathers, um, pleat, actually tiny pleats really, forming the effect of gathers right here at the waist. Um, and this has a type of bust line that I really wanted to show you. This is what we call a shelf bust, is what it's frequently called. So this has a pleated bust, I guess this one really isn't a true shelf bust because in a true shelf bust, this layer would sit directly under the bust, whereas on this dress, it sort of crosses it. Um, but something that you'll see in a lot of dresses of this type is you've got a pleated section forming either a V or sort of sweetheart neckline, or you can sometimes have it going straight across depending on the design of the dress. Um, this one's got really good design repetition. We've got this V formed by these crisp little pleats here. And then if you notice, the seaming also has some Vs happening. So this seam, this seam that goes under the bust forms a V right here at the center. And then if you turn it to this side and look at it, you can see it comes up in an inverse V and comes back, uh, sort of forming a dart. So this is some pretty clever pattern techniques going on here. We've got a little bitty cap sleeve. It's only, I'd say, just over two inches wide or right about two inches here at the shoulder. The collar comes up around it. This one has a side zipper. It also has a matching belt. It's got belt carriers here. Um, I have the matching belt, but did not put it on the dress. So all in all, just a really nice little dress. The way the pleats are sewn makes me think it is most likely commercially made, but this one does not have any labels in it. So we're not able to know for sure. It's got a very nice blind hem here which as most dresses of this period, it's got um, hem tape in it, which is a really nice way to finish off this hem without adding any extra bulk. If you turn under your fabric twice, you've got a nice finished edge, but you've also got fabric turned under twice, which on some fabrics can show through when you press it. Since the hem tape is applied on top of the fabric, it gives it a really good flat sort of a finish. Um, very nicely done. You'll also notice that this dress has pinked seams, which is not a finish that we typically see on commercial garments now, but was a little more common in the 50s. Uh, this is one of my favorite sundresses. This one is made of cotton, and it's got some really good 50s characteristics that we need to know about. The first, this one is a little bit more of a true shelf bust. You can see it's got a seam right here that goes just under the bust, and we've got a lot of gathered fullness here in the bust line. This is a really easy dress to wear for a couple of reasons. Um, it's got a lot of variability in the way the bust fits. So if you're a little well endowed, this dress has room. If you've got a little bit less going on in your bust area, this dress fills it in nicely. It's very, very forgiving. Um, again, we've got this significant waist emphasis, a very, very full gathered skirt. Um, and this dress has princess seams. Uh, right here in the midriff section. This is a halter dress. It's got a little self-fabric bow. It's finished on the edge in bias tape. And this one does have a center back zipper. So we've still got a metal zipper. Um, this is a 50s dress. The skirt length is starting to climb up a little bit, which combined with the center back zipper would have me put this at a little bit later part of the 50s. And the thing that makes this dress really fun and um, really just very suited to its design is the fabric. This is a special kind of fabric known as a border print. So if you look at this dress, uh, pardon the boxes of books on my hearth, if you look at this dress, it's not just the same design all the way around. It actually has a design that runs along the selvage of the fabric. And that design has been used really, really well here um, as they used the edge of the fabric up here at the top where we've got denser flowers and again at the bottom of the dress. Um, so a border print gives really some very fun designs that can be accomplished. The limitation to a border print is that you can only do things that are straight. So you can't do, say, 
a gourd A-line type skirt because the bottom edge of that would be curved. So you're limited to gathered or pleated skirts in a border print for the most part. And then a lot of patterns that call for the use of border prints use them in really creative ways in the bodice as we're seeing here. Now, I chose this dress to show you. This is one of my all-time favorite dresses. I don't wear a lot of black, but I love this one. The reason I chose to show you this dress was it's kind of the quintessential 1950s wiggle dress. Again, I don't think wiggle dress is a period term. It seems to be one that's been applied a bit later. But this one, whatever we choose to call it, is a really good representation. So the really interesting thing about this silhouette is it looks really, really different from the big full skirt silhouette. But all the body emphasis still remains the same. So we've got the same skirt length. We've got a lot of shoulder emphasis, but or I should say bust emphasis more so than shoulder emphasis. We've got bust emphasis and uh, waist emphasis created by broader shoulders, wide necklines sloping into this narrow waist. And that's really visible here. The other thing that this dress has, making it kind of quintessentially 50s, is it's got a very pointy bust, which you can see as I've turned it sideways. Um, I know it's hard to see the details on this dress. This dress is black velveteen. You may recall from textiles class that velveteen is a pile fabric. It's a little like velvet, except it's got a shorter pile and it's made of a staple fiber, in this case, cotton. This dress is faced with taffeta. It's unlined, but it does have these taffeta facings. So you'll see a little facing right here inside the sleeve. And there's a similar one in the neckline. This one is by Tabac of California, not a brand that I'm very familiar with. One thing that you'll have on these 1950s wiggle dresses is a way to tell the difference between the earlier part of the 50s and the later part is the earlier 50s have a longer skirt. By the late 50s, we're starting to see hemlines rise just a little bit. In the 1960s, we see hemlines come back up again to just a little below the knee and everything starts to get wider and boxier. This dress is still very much a long but curvy silhouette. It comes to mid-calf. Now, just like so many of the other dresses we've seen, this dress has a sleeve that's cut in one with the bodice. You cannot see it. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. And it's got a gusset here under the sleeves. So there's a seam running this way, a diamond shaped piece that allows you to raise your arms in this dress. This is actually a very comfortable dress, except that you do have to wear a girdle with it for the appropriate shaping, rendering it slightly less comfortable, but oh my gosh, it looks so good on. Now this is one of my favorite dresses and I'm really excited to show it to you. I think this one probably dates in the latter part of the 50s, maybe a little bit towards the 60s. We've still got um, kind of this longish skirt, but this particular type of style, which I'll show you in a minute when I take the jacket off, was most commonly seen in the later part of the 50s. This dress, which I got from Better Dresses Vintage in Atlanta, um, was homemade. I will bet you money that this one was made from a Vogue pattern. It's made of silk. It's got these fantastic colors, this kind of abstracted sort of watercolor impressionistic kind of print, which I really, really love. The jacket is very dramatic. Again, we have a cut in one sleeve, as you can see, um, contributing again to that sloping shoulder look. We've got some bust emphasis happening here with this very dramatic jacket. This jacket can be worn a couple of ways. It's got a snap here that allows it to fasten uh, looks like from the holes in the fabric it may have had another snap that allowed it to fasten like this or you can let it hang and drape the way I had it when you saw it just a second ago. I'm going to show you another gusset though. This jacket has a gusset in it too. I don't know if you can see but it has a triangular gusset uh, right here. Again used uh, particularly with this type of sleeve uh, for you to be able to raise your arm without ripping your dress. Now without the jacket I just love this dress. Um, this dress has a fantastic asymmetrical design. It's got um, narrow straps. These are uh, probably about half an inch wide. And we've got a fun asymmetrical design, both at the waist and up here at the neckline. If you look at it straight on, the neckline comes up in a slight angle and then to this point right here before continuing along in the rest of the dress. We've got very well done pleats right in through here. Um, finishing in a self-fabric bow at the waist. Again, giving you that waist emphasis and kind of some hip emphasis too. The skirt is darted. 
very, very fitted through the hips. The other fun thing about this is that the owner of this dress liked it well enough to alter it to fit. So if we take a look at this closely, you can see the original marking for her stitching line. It's marked in orange, and you can see a little bit right here by my finger. Now, just inside that is a line where at one point this dress was stitched, so she had a little bigger hips than the pattern called for. Stitch this just a little bit looser. There's a, another stitching line right here, and then the stitching line where it currently is. So this dress has been let out ooh, from the pattern a good inch and a half from the way it was originally stitched, a good inch in each hip, so a total of about um, over two inches change. But I just thought that was fun. This dress was beloved enough for this amount of work to be done on it. So this next dress that I wanted to show you, I did not want to try to wrestle onto the dress form. Getting these uh, slim fitting dresses onto the form is challenging. So I wanted to show you this. This is a really nice example of this slim skirt or wiggle dress type silhouette. This dress is made of red wool. The fabric is by Pacific Mills. We don't know who the actual dress is by. Um, but again, cut in one sleeve. We've got some serious bust emphasis going on here with this bow coming down again into a very fitted waist, side metal zipper, and it has pockets. Uh, pockets kind of form a, you know, dual purpose here. Um, one, obviously nice for storing things. Number two, pockets kind of contribute to the hip emphasis of this particular dress. This dress is unlined. It does have some very small shoulder pads, um, like what you would see in the 40s. Um, these are a bit smaller than a lot of the ones that we saw in the 40s, but still kind of giving it that structure, especially since it is a wool dress. Um, you'll often see a little bit more tailored sorts of elements like that. This last garment that I want to show you on my dress form is one of my all-time best finds. This is a Lily Ann suit jacket. I've got the matching skirt as well. And I picked this up at an estate sale in Athens, Georgia. It was a going away dress for this lady. I was able to find, with the help of some online friends, an original ad for this Lily Ann. And if you adjust for inflation from approximately the year that this was, this would have been about a thousand dollar suit. <laughs> it's really nice. Um, and this has some really, it's, it's a really, really good archetype of kind of the um, fashion goals of 1950s suits. And that's what I wanted to show you here. Now, we saw big collars, uh, some in the 40s, but this 50s big collar is a little different. You'll notice that instead of increasing the emphasis on the shoulder by having an upward sort of a triangle, as we might have seen in the 40s, this one has a downward triangle increasing the visual width of the bust. So this fits with our usual goal <laughs> that we've been seeing all through the 50s of emphasizing the bust and the waist ratio along with the hips. So we've got this broad collar making the bust look a lot broader. We have a very, very fitted waist here. And then we've got a pronounced hip. And I'm going to show you a really cool construction trick that Lillian used for this particular jacket. This has bound buttonholes. The strips here are bias cut wool, and you can see the pipe, it, the same turquoise wool is repeated in the piping, which helps again to accentuate the figure here. The skirt that goes with this, with this jacket is a very slim pencil skirt. We're going to look a little at the inside of this jacket. So first we've got our Lily Ann label here, Lily Ann of San Francisco. Uh, Lily Ann was very, very well known for tailoring. So the things that you'll most often see from Lily Ann are suits and coats. The fabric is from France and was imported specifically for Lily Ann. We've got a label related to the fabric as well. We've also got a consumer's protection label, uh, manufactured under fair label standards. So basically we have a fair trade label in this particular one. Now, the construction piece that I really wanted to show you is this band right here. To increase the hip emphasis for this dress, there is some extra ease in the hip and it is taken up 
by this band. You can see that there's a lot of space in the fabric between the band and my finger. And this band fits against the body and forces the jacket to flare out at the hips, which really gives you that 1950s new look silhouette. To close this out today, I wanted to talk undies. So I've brought a couple of bras from my collection to show you. This one is, um, I believe it's a figurette. This is a figurette bra. And the reason I pulled this one is it really exemplifies the bullet bra sort of shape of the 50s. This particular one, it's fairly extreme. It's not the most extreme, but you can see it's got some point to it. A lot of projection in this bra. And so the 50s is really known for having pointy bras. <laughs> Um, this is more of an everyday bra. Um, the straps don't stretch. This panel doesn't stretch. We've got a bit of um, power mesh right here. And we've got some power mesh and some elastic in this band. Um, but yeah, this figurettes bra is a really good example of an everyday sort of bra from the 50s. Now, when you need a little more shaping, for a dress that flares out in the skirt, you can just stop with just this. Or if you want shaping all the way down, if you've got a very fitted skirt, you could pair this with a separate girdle. Uh, so this is a late 50s bra. It's by Peter Pan, and it's one of my favorites. We've got Marquisette fabric right here um, in the center front, and a non-stretch with lace over it right here. There's power mesh in the back two sections and some really wide two inch elastic here. This cup has a bit of padding to help us achieve that bust emphasis. Again, if I hold this up, you can see it's got a bit of a point to the cups. It's got underwires and it's padded with polyester batting. Uh, you'll also notice it has boning. Uh, as we've discussed in several classes, you need to have boning or anything that you don't want, that's tightly fitted that you don't want to collapse on the body. And so we've got six pieces of boning in this particular bra. It is spiral steel and provides some really excellent support. Next, I wanted to talk about petticoats. Um, I had these petticoats on the dress form earlier. I wanted to show them to you. This is a vintage 50s petticoat from Nashville, Tennessee. We've got lace. A lot of these had some decoration on them. So we've got lace here and some ruching. Underneath that, we've got a lining that's got netting here and then a bit of a tape to stiffen the bottom edge just a bit. A lot of petticoats from the 50s, and this one is no exception, feature a kind of a fitted yoke and then flare out a little bit below. This makes them work a little better for dresses with a dropped waist. Um, this one has a sheer uh, trico outer layer. The inside is a woven fabric, which again has this sort of tape here on the bottom, and it's got an elastic waist. Now, for formal occasions, you may have needed to pull out the big guns. This one is one of the big guns. This petticoat is by Hoops Midian, and it came with a 50s formal dress. It buttons in the back. Again, we've got this yoke, and then we've got what basically feels like horsehair braid, but it is a wide fabric by the yard that forms the entire petticoat. It's pleated on here. I don't think you could really gather this with too much success. And we've got a deep hem, giving it a little more oomph at the hem. And we've got a very nicely done um, bit of tape here to protect against the raw edges. Finally, I've got a bit of a funny story for you about 50s petticoats. I was working on a dress for a project that on the pattern said, oh, you need a buckram petticoat. I'm like, buckram petticoat? What the heck? I couldn't find anything on the internet for buckram petticoat. I could find no extant buckram petticoats. And in case you're not familiar, buckram is the stuff that you make hats out of. I couldn't find it anywhere. So in desperation, I phoned my friend, Miss Peggy. Miss Peggy got married in 1958. Uh, so she, and she was a model for Seventeen magazine. She is intimately familiar with 50s fashion. She was and is quite a bit of a fashionista. So I called Miss Peggy to ask her about this mysterious buckram petticoat. And she goes, oh, those things. Oh, they were so uncomfortable. I tried one on and I just didn't buy it because it was just too scratchy. I could not handle that thing. She's like, 
I bet if anybody did buy them, they took them out back and burned them after they were done with them. And that's why we don't have any surviving examples. So thank you for joining me for this discussion of 50s. I'll see you later.